Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. When we try to perfect ourselves, it only causes frustration, struggle and failure. Now we should want to change. The more I read the word, the more I want to change. However, it is only God that can ultimately change us. Jehovah Nisi, he is our victory. Jehovah M. Kadesh, the Lord who sanctifies us. And what that literally means is God is the one that changes us. Oh, that's relaxing. I don't have to try to change myself. God will do it. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Now, does that mean that there's nothing for me to do? No. I need to put the grocery cart back. I need to pray for my parents. I need to help them in their old age, whether they were good to me or not. There's thousands of things like that throughout my life. And you, how many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? You go through this all the time, all the time. Well, let me tell you something. Every time that you obey God, and I might even add, the harder it is to obey God, the more valuable it is to you because when we do what's right while it still feels wrong, we are growing spiritually. Let God into these areas of your life. You don't have to go to Bible school. It's nice if you want to, but you don't have to. You can get a degree from the school of the Holy Ghost if you'll just let God be involved in everything you do everywhere you go. Leviticus 20 verse 8 says, I am the Lord who sanctifies. When we try to perfect ourselves, it only causes frustration, struggle, and failure. Now we should want to change. The more I read the word, the more I want to change. We should pray to change. We should study the word in the areas where we want to change and make choices that go along with the change that we want. However, it is only God that can ultimately change us. Boy, what a relief it was to Dave when I found out that I couldn't change him. <laughs> that only God could change him. And then it was even quite shocking to me to find out that maybe, just maybe, God liked him just the way he was. <laughs> I couldn't quite figure that out, but... And then even beyond that, and this was really hard for me, that maybe it wasn't him that had the problem, it could be me. Oh, my gosh, this growing up thing is so hard. I can still feel the pain in my soul from all those years of trying to learn how to just keep my mouth shut sometimes. Because you see, sometimes the thing that God will whisper that's between you and your victory is just, you don't need to say anything. <laughs> Come on, does anybody understand what I'm talking about? I'm going to be very honest with you. To me, living this life with God, doing life with God, and being obedient to Him everywhere you go, in the grocery store, out, you know, whatever it is. To me, that's more important than if you answered a call on your life to go to Africa and live there as a missionary all your life. I think a lot of people maybe will submit to do these big things that's going to impress everybody, but when it comes to the little private things that you don't even, wouldn't even be worth telling anybody. Come on. We have a private life with God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He lives in us. And everything about our life 
should be dedicated to him. Paul writes to those that he calls consecrated, purified, and made holy in Christ Jesus. Let's look at Philippians 2, 12, and 13, quite long in the Amplified Bible, but very much worth looking at. Can anybody think of some little things that maybe you've been letting go that you should maybe start attending to? Nobody? Do I need to rewind and start over? It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now, not only with the enthusiasm that you would show in my presence, but much more when I'm absent, and I love this, it's almost like a pastor saying, okay, you behave in front of me, but the thing I really want you to do is go home and behave at home. Come on, you, you know how it goes. Dave and I would fight all morning and fight all the way to church and argue in the parking lot and have the kids all crying. But boy, when we saw the first person at the church, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Get in the church service, sing the songs jump up and down, and I'd be thinking, if he thinks I'm fixing him anything to eat today, he's getting anything to eat. Come on, that's not consecration. That's phony, baloney, religious. It's me pretending something that's not real inside. Get in the car and fight all the way home, then get mad because Dave watched football on Sundays and cry the rest of the day and feel sorry for myself. And I went to church. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. We went to church. So not only when I'm with you, <laughs> but when I'm absent. Now watch this. Work out. I'm going to start over because I don't want anybody lost. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now not only with the enthusiasm that you would show in my presence, but much more because I'm absent, work out cultivate, carry out to the goal, and fully complete your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling, self-distrust, serious caution, tenderness of conscience, watchfulness against temptation. Sounds like a lot of work to me. <laughs> Timidly shrinking from whatever might offend God and discredit the name of Christ. And boy, I love verse 13, not in your own strength. For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire to will and to work for his good pleasure. So long, you may have missed half of it, but basically what he's saying is, okay, when you're saved, you have all the good stuff in you. Man, you got it. You know, you've been made right with God through the blood of Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. But now that righteousness needs to be worked from the inside of you to the outside of you. So the first thing that happens is God begins to renew our, renew our mind and teach us how to think right. And then when we begin to think right, we'll begin to talk right. And then we'll begin to act right. And then we'll begin to treat people right. And so now a little bit of what is in us has been worked out through us where maybe somebody else can witness it and believe that God is real and believe there might be some hope for them. And it's a lifelong process. He who began a good work in you will complete it and bring it to its finish. Now, you know, when I really fell in love with Jesus and started reading the Word, I mean, I, I had a whole different set of problems because the more I read this thing, the more I saw that was wrong with me. And it was very hard to go to church and not go home depressed because I don't care what anybody preached on, I needed it. I mean, I had every problem. I just didn't have some problems. I had every problem. Does anybody kind of feel like, okay. So, but let me tell you something. Conviction is totally different than condemnation. We need to be glad for conviction and resist condemnation. 
And what I would do is the Holy Spirit would use the word to convict me, whatever it was. You talk too much. That one always worked. You talk too much. And so then I would go home, I would go home, and I would decide that I was going to fix it. So I would decide then that I was going to not say anything at all. And then the same people that were telling me, you talk too much, can't you ever shut your mouth, now were telling me, what's wrong with you? Why are you not talking? <laughs> and so then I would do what we always do. You're never satisfied. I don't care. If I, don't, if I talk, you don't like it. If I don't talk, you don't like it. I oh, no, we just never change. There's no, I can't suit people no matter what I do. Say, what I should have done and what you should do, if I say anything today that God uses to convict you in any area of your life, don't you dare go home and say, well, bless God, I, I heard I'm going to change. No, you're just looking for another disaster. What you say is, God, I agree with you. I felt your conviction, and I agree with you. You're right, and I'm wrong, and I repent. I want to change and turn away from that. And now I trust you who has begun a good work in me to complete it and bring it to its finish. I trust you to change me. Now, here comes some really good news. I don't know if you can handle this or not, but you can actually enjoy yourself while God is changing you. You don't have to wait till you're perfected to like yourself. I like myself right now. And I still have a long way to go. <laughs> thank you. You have to learn how to say, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. First Thessalonians 5.23. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. Separate you from profane things and make you pure and wholly consecrated to God. And may your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 24. Faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy and he will also do it. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. And then you, you so you go, yes, God, I want that. Lord, I want that. I, I want to be holy in every area of my life. And then it says, okay, trust me, and I will do it. God will work it out in your life little by little from glory to glory. He shows you something. By his grace, you do it. You fail 20 times. You finally get it right. There's a little change. God shows you something else. You're stubborn for 10 weeks, takes you two years to put the grocery cart back. You finally get it. Okay, God, I'm, you're not going to leave me alone. I'm going to put it back. And there are just thousands of little things like that. But part of the purpose of somebody like me doing what I'm doing is I can save you a lot of turns around that same stupid mountain if you'll listen to me. If God is telling you whatever, whatever it might be, stop playing on your computer all day at work when the boss is not looking. Because here's the truth, it's stealing. <laughs> Don't do anything behind your boss's back that you wouldn't do if he was watching. Okay, well. Come on, how many pencils and ballpoint pens do you have at home that came from your place of work? Now, you know, I, you, whatever, you do what you want to with this, but I'm telling you, there were times in my life when God said, you gather them all up and take them back. <laughs> and I've learned how to try to be obedient to God in all these little things. And I don't have to do that to go to heaven. We don't have to do this to go to heaven. I'm talking about doing life with God. I'm talking about living for God's glory. I'm talking about living a sanctified life. Listen, I'm going to heaven even if I take pencils from the office. I don't 
go to heaven because I do everything perfectly. I believe in Jesus Christ. Now, there are some things that I think can get you in worse trouble than a pencil, but my point is, is I'm not talking about legalism and, and living this life that makes you a nervous wreck because you're petrified you're going to do something wrong all the time. Yes, I could have left the grocery cart out there and let it chase cars around. I could have done all kinds of things. I could have done that. But now watch what I'm going to tell you. I wouldn't be here today. I was complaining to God one time because I just felt like he was just, you know, pretty strict with me about what I could and couldn't do, what I could and couldn't watch on TV and the kind of movies I could go to and different things like that. And it was all just stuff between me and God in my heart. And you have the same kind of stuff going on. And you know, when God asks you not to do something, don't go back and tell them, well, everybody else does it. <laughs> you're not everybody else. You're you, and God's got a plan for you. And if you listen to God for you, then you can have the blessings that God has for you. If everybody else in the world wants to do without theirs, that's up to them. And so, I mean, I, I knew pastors and other spiritual people who did a lot of these things that I felt like God was telling me I couldn't do. And I just got kind of ticked off. And I was just like, well, God, I don't understand. Everybody else does this stuff, and, you know, you're still using them. And boy, 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 I still remember it. He said, look, you've asked me for a lot. Do you want it or not? <laughs> Sanctification, separation unto God for a special purpose. We are separated unto God for a special purpose. I'm talking to each one of you individually Stop acting like you belong to yourself because you don't. You've been bought with a price, paid for with a preciousness. You are no longer your own. You belong to God. You are a vessel that should be set aside for his use. So it goes like this. God, here I am. Your will be done and not mine. Whatever you want, wherever you want me, it's up to you. You know, we need to live without all the mixture that we have in our lives. Don't be one way on Sunday and a different way the rest of the week. One of the greatest compliments that anybody can give you is to say that you live out during the week what you say you believe when you're in church. In Revelations, there's a lot of interesting scriptures. I won't take time to go through many of them, but in Revelation 2, it says, you've done good works, but you've left your first love. Not everyone, Matthew says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom because I never knew you. He told some they were clinging to false teaching. You know, it's very popular today in the name of freedom to support everybody in their own particular belief, no matter how cultish or unholy it is. We call it tolerance. Well, you got to be a little careful with some of the stuff that's going on today. You might work with somebody who's off base spiritually and living in some kind of sin, and it is important that you're cordial and present yourself in a loving manner. You can't preach to people everywhere that you go, but neither can you agree with them and let them think that whatever is okay, because whatever is not okay. What's the essence of what I'm saying? Let's let God do that sanctification work in us, where every day we're moving deeper into new levels of holiness and new levels of commitment to Him. And you know, one of the things that I would like to ask today, are there people here that are ready to make a deeper commitment to God? You're ready to let him get out of Sunday and get into Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and into the grocery store and into the marketplace and where you work and where you go to school and into your neighborhoods. Don't tolerate Jezebel anymore. We don't need to tolerate sin. And on and on and on and on. I don't have enough time to do it all. Jehovah to Sid Canoe, the Lord our righteousness. My goodness, I love that. Let me tell you something. You need to learn how to separate your who and your do. You may not do everything right, but you are God's child, and he loves you, and he's never going to stop loving you. Amen.
And if you just throw your heart open to God today and you say, God, I want your will in my life, please don't ever stop working with me. God will work with you and work with you and work with you and work with you. And you don't have to be condemned. You don't have to not like yourself while you're in the process. Listen, I'm enjoying this thing with God. I'm enjoying this. God, change me and make me more like Jesus every day. Please don't ever leave me alone. Don't let me just live like an idiot and not even know it. Tell me, God, the things that you want me to see. Let's quit all this, oh, get another thing wrong with me. Be glad that God loves you enough to show you when you need change in an area and then ask him to change you. God, change me. You're the only one that can change me. How many of you have been struggling with yourself trying to change yourself and it's just been so frustrating? Are you understanding that only God can change you? Only God can change you. Whatever you hear today that might convict you, what you should do when you leave is say, God, I agree. I heard you speaking to me. I want your will. Now I ask you to change me and whatever thing you might want me to do or if you want me to do nothing, show me what it is, make it plain and give me the grace to do it and I'll walk it out. But when push comes to shove, God, only you can change people. So, man, we got it all. And then over here in the New Testament, we've really got it because we've got the name of Jesus. The name that is above every name. Let's look at Philippians 2, verse 8. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of the death of the cross. Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name that in and at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. Now, we've been given that name. We have been given the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus. You know, there are times when I will tell people, well, call my office, and if you have any trouble getting through, tell them, Joyce told me to call. So I give them permission to use my name. And that is just so very minor compared to what we're talking about here today. When we use the name of Jesus properly, Jesus said, it's no different than him being there. When he left, he sent us the Holy Spirit and he gave us his name. And he said, now you can pray in my name, and when you do, you're presenting to the Father everything that I am. Aren't you glad that you don't have to present what you are when you go to the throne of God? I love that. But let, let me give you a little insight that I got a few years ago, and I love this. I share this pretty often, but I can't not share it here today. You know, when I married Dave, I got his name. And now I can, I can use his name. It's my name been given to me. And when Dave and I got married, he had money. I didn't have any, and all of a sudden, I had money. <laughs> Good deal. Amen? <laughs> when we got married, I didn't have a car, and Dave had a nice, pretty new car. Man, all of a sudden, I had a car. <laughs> well, you know, that's pretty much the way it is when you come into a relationship with Jesus. We come pretty much bankrupt, and he's got everything. And then all of a sudden, because we've got him, now we've got everything. But here comes the really good part. However, I didn't get any of that while we were dating. Are you dating Jesus? Or are you married? Amen? When you're married, then you share everything. What's mine is his, what's his is mine. I get his name, I can use his name as if it was my name. But that means faithfulness in every area of my life. Amen? Let me tell you something. God is everything that you will ever need him to be in any situation. How can anybody possibly know God and not want to have a relationship with him? 
He is your peace, your righteousness, your sanctification, your victory. He is the one and only true God. He's everything that we need him to be. So don't let him be too little in your life. Let God be big to you. Go to him for everything, all the time. Let's let him be number one, amen? Well, God is our victory, and he lives in us through his Holy Spirit. He sanctifies us, sets us apart for a special purpose. Thankfully, we don't have to try to change ourselves. We can allow God to do it. All we need to do is to cooperate with him. We just need to kind of let go and let God be God. You know, everything that I know that I teach you and everything that I know about God, I've learned from his word. I don't even know how to begin to tell you how powerful and how important the Word of God is. The Bible actually shows us that there is inherent power in the Word of God. That means when I study the Word, when I speak the Word, each one of those words is like a little power capsule that when it's spoken, it's like it breaks open in my life and produces that power that changes and changes circumstances and changes people and drives the enemy away. Well, we're in Rwanda at the Kingdom Education Center where we're being permitted by the grace of God to work with these beautiful children here. And one of the things that they're teaching the children is that the healing of a nation begins with receiving the love of Jesus Christ and by forgiving. That's the way we can help every nation that's hurting, is by teaching them to love God and to love other people. And the best place to start is with the children. Thank you so much for helping us give these children a new life so this can be a brand new nation. God bless you.